And um, it is my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Robin uh, Schrucker, uh, and uh, from from right now still the University of Copenhagen, uh, but soon to be have another job. Um, uh, and and uh, he will speak on the high dimensional rational cohomology of symplectic groups. Yeah. Hi everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation to speak and for um, to the organizers for making this uh, possible. Um, yes. So I'm gonna speak about the high dimensional rational cohomology of symplectic groups, and uh, the idea of this lecture will be to tell a story parallel to what we have heard. Uh, in Jennifer Wilson's lectures, but for a subgroup of the special linear groups, uh, which are these symplectic groups. Um, so before I uh, give a definition of the symplectic groups and uh, give a general introduction, um, I would like to point out two places in which uh, symplectic groups show up. Um, the first one is in low dimensional topology. Uh, namely, there is a short exact sequence of groups that starts with the Torelli group, uh, then goes into the mapping class group of a surface orientable of genus G. And then this surjects onto uh, the symplectic group over 2G over the integers. So this is a short exact sequence um, that relates uh, the symplectic group that this talk is about to the map mapping class group that we have heard about in other talks uh, and this mysterious object, which is called the Torelli group. And um, there are a lot, lot of open questions about this. Um, another place where symplectic groups show up uh, and this connects it to the title of this master class um, is as a moduli space, namely when co one can construct AG, the moduli space of uh, principally polarized abelian varieties as a quotient of a certain symmetric space um, by the sim uh, symplectic group. So if you have been uh, to the introduction lecture by Peter Potts, uh, then you have seen this before. Okay, so I'm not gonna talk about these connections. I'm just gonna focus on uh, the symplectic groups. So let me start by giving a definition of what symplectic groups are. And for this, I will fix uh, some notation. So in this talk, we're gonna work um, over the rational vector space Q to the power of 2n. Inside this, we're gonna find the standard, standardly embedded uh, B abelian group on uh, 2n generators. And inside this, we will uh, fix the standard basis, um, which I will denote by E1 to EN. And then the second half of the standard basis, I will write uh, EN bar to E1 bar. Um, so the reason for this notation will become apparent in a minute. Just uh, bear with me. So this is the setting in which this talk will take place. So now let's turn to the introduction and to the definition of the symplectic groups. Um, for this, I will need to uh, tell you what a symplectic uh, vector space is or a symplectic module. So this is a uh, vector space, namely we will care about this one and this module here, equipped with a bilinear form, uh, which is alternating and um, non-degenerate. And uh, this is what I want to define uh, for the start. And then the symplectic group uh, will be the matrix, the matrix group, uh, which leaves these, um, which preserves this form. So what is the symplectic form? Uh, I will just do uh, the definition over the rationals. And then by restriction, we can do the same thing over the integers. So this is a bilinear form. So we take as an input two vectors in Q to the power of two N, and then we get out a scalar in Q. And 
I will specify this form by saying what it does on this basis. So the first condition is that if I plug in two vectors that live in the first half um, of the spaces or in the second half of the spaces, then this form will evaluate to zero. And the second condition is that if I mix bars and non-bars, so if I plug in a vector from the first half and a vector from the second half, then this will evaluate um, as a Kronecker delta with, re with regard to these two indices, i and j. So this is why I picked this notation. And now the alternatingness of this uh, symplectic form comes into play that by if I swap these two entries, then I will get exactly minus the Kronecker delta. So really the only interesting thing that uh, can happen is uh, whenever I plug in two uh, basis elements that have the same index and uh, one has a bar over it. Uh, and in this case, they evaluate uh, to one or minus one. And I want to call these symplectic pairs. So this will be an important notion throughout this talk. Okay, so now we can come to the definition of symplectic groups. I've already given one, namely it is the subgroup of the special linear groups uh, of matrices that preserve this form, the symplectic form omega that I've just defined. But equivalently, a matrix in, is inside this symplectic group if I consider the uh, column vectors of this matrix, I can index them similar to what I've written up here by the numbers one to n and n bar to m1 bar. And now these column vectors should form a symplectic basis. So this means that they should satisfy these equations. Okay, great. So now I've introduced the symplectic group over the rationals. And then of course, and this will be uh, the object that we will be studying in this talk. Uh, by restriction to the integers, we get the symplectic groups uh, that, yes, that we will be studying. Okay. Are there any questions about the definition of symplectic groups so far? Great. So now I want to connect this uh, to Michaela Janssen's talk. Um, namely, the whole machinery that she explained uh, to us that works for special linear groups, namely having a Borel, uh, namely having a symmetric space and being able to compactify it. Um, all this also applies um, to these symplectic groups. I don't want to say too much detail about this because we have already heard about that. So let me just say that it's a theorem by Borel Sayer. That um, the virtual cohomological dimension of the symplectic group is finite. And they also computed and it's equal to uh, N squared. So this in particular implies that if we are interested in the cohomology, then the co rational cohomology in degrees bigger than n squared will vanish. So this means that we can make sense of talking about the top dimension homology, but this we will mean homology in this degree. 
the other statement that we get from Borel's here is that uh, the symplectic groups are uh, virtual Barry Ekman duality groups. So the symplectic group is a Barry Ekman. Uh, a virtual, sorry, uh, Barry Ekman duality group. Um, so what this buys us is uh, that there is a, a dualizing module. And this dualizing module uh, will be called the symplectic Steinberg module. Um, so I will say more about this uh, later in the talk, but for now, I just want you to know that it also comes from a Dietz building. It will be the top dimensional homology of a Dietz building. Um, and uh, all that we need to know at this point uh, is that this here is really the dualizing module. So this means that in rational cohomology, uh, we get the following duality statement by capping by by capping with a certain class. So the rational cohomology of the symplectic groups in co-dimension I uh, can be identified with the isomology of the symplectic group. Um, with coefficients in the rationalized Steinberg module. Okay. So this in particular means that we are in exactly the same setting as we have been uh, for special linear groups. So this means that we can ask similar questions. We can now ask the analog of this conjecture of Church, Barb, and Putman. Namely, does this high dimensional rational cohomology vanish whenever n is sufficiently large compared to i. And this is really what I want to talk about. For n sufficiently large compared to i. And the focus of this talk will be on codimension one and codimension zero uh, in the opposite order. So codimension i equals to zero and i equals to one. Okay. So the uh, codimension zero case, uh, which deals with the question whether the top rational cohomology of symplectic groups vanishes, is already contained in the literature. Um, yes, so what is the statement? Uh, the statement is that the top dimensional homology of symplectic groups over the integers with coefficients in trivial rational, co um, trivial rational coefficients. So this means by uh, Borel's yeah duality, uh, the co-invariance of the rationalized Steinberg module, which up to now is just the dualizing module um, of the symplectic group, uh, this is zero. And um, this theorem uh, follows from a theorem of Gunnels, which has been proven in 2000, I believe. And uh, Gunnels theorem is really parallel, is the parallel result um, to the theorem of Ash Rudolph um, that Jennifer Wilson talked about in her lectures. Um, and Gunnels used similar methods uh, to prove this theorem. Namely, the theorem states that the Steinberg module has a nice generating set, which is given by integral apartments.
So for now, this statement maybe gives some intuition if you have been uh, to the lecture series of Jen Jen Jennifer Wilson. Uh, apartments for the symplectic groups will mean something different. So they are symplectic apartments. Um, but I will explain the content of this uh, theorem uh, in this lecture. Um, for those who are not familiar with or have not been to um, Jennifer Wilson's lectures, um, an equivalent formulation of this theorem is uh, that a certain map from the group ring of the symplectic groups into the Steinberg module is a surjection. So here now, um, really the uh, symplectic group parameterizes generators of the symplectic Steinberg module. Uh, in the literature, this map here is often called uh, the modular symbol map, and it will be an exercise um, to prove that um, Gunnell theorem implies this uh, vanishing in the top dimensional homology. So this is not what I'm going to talk about. Uh, instead, um, as uh, in the lectures of Jennifer Wilson, I will uh, present an alternative proof of Gunnell's theorem. So the goal today is to give an alternative proof. Um, which is inspired by the methods that have been developed by uh, Church, Bart, and Putman. And uh, this proof will be based on an idea um, of Putman. Okay. And then there, I mentioned the co-dimension zero case. So this is something that um, Peter Putz, Benjamin Brick, and I am currently working on. So let me just mention this as a work in progress here. We don't have a complete proof of this yet. So this is work in progress. Uh, with Brick. Uh, Putz and myself. And uh, what we try to what we try to prove is that the co-dimension zero, uh, the co-dimension one uh, cohomology also vanishes. And if time permits, um, maybe I can say a little bit about uh, the type of strategy that we are. Uh, trying to use to prove this. So I put a question mark here because it's not a theorem yet. Okay. So are there any questions about the general setup so far? Yep. Uh, that I don't know. Sorry. I think it's n squared minus n. But Oh, yes, sorry, n squared plus. Yeah, sorry, so the question was, what is the dimension of the symmetric space? And I'm not certain about it, but so after, let me correct my statement. Maybe I, th I think it's n squared plus n. So because it's a rank n. Yeah. Yeah, okay, great. Um, good. Are there any other questions? No? Fantastic. Then, so I have, uh, in order to prove Gunnell's theorem, I would like to take the perspective of this modular symbol map, so the map that I've, I've written up there. Um, I have just defined what the domain of this arrow is. So now I want to define what uh, the target is, namely, I want to give you a description of the symplectic Steinberg module.
So I've already mentioned that the symplectic Steinberg module will arise as the top dimensional homology of a Dietz building. Uh, but unlike in the uh, special linear group case, we will not take all subspaces. We will need um, a notion of subspace that is somehow amenable uh, to symplectic groups. So this is what the first definition is. Um, a subspace of Q to the power of 2n is called isotropic. Um, if the symplectic form restricted to this subspace vanishes. Okay. Let me give you a couple of examples of isotropic subspaces. Uh, so the fact that the symplectic form is alternating implies that any one dimensional subspace, so any line inside Q to the power of 2n will be isotropic. And then another source of subspaces uh, actually come from uh, elements in the symplectic group. And this will be an example that is important for us. Namely, if I have an element in the symplectic group, then by the definition that I gave you, I can look at the column vectors and they form a symplectic basis. So this means that the symplectic form is only non-zero if I uh, plug in to if I plug in a symplectic pair. So this means in particular that I can take a subset uh, of this of this basis. Um, which does not contain a symplectic pair. Not containing. And by the symplectic pair, I really just mean two vectors that evaluate to one or minus one. And then the rational span of this set uh, will give me an example of an isotropic subspace. This is isotropic. Yeah, sorry. Okay, so now we can ask, maybe a reasonable question to ask is, uh, what is the dimension of a maximal um, isotropic subspace? Uh, and I will just give this here as a fact. Uh, it will help us to calculate the dimension of the symplectic Keats building. So a maximal isotropic subspace uh, will have dimension n. So in particular, if I take the first n basis vectors um, of a symplectic matrix, then I can look at the subspace spanned by that. And this will be an example of a maximal uh, isotropic subspace. And these are often in the literature also called Lagrangians. Okay, so with this, we can now turn to the definition of the symplectic Keats building. And uh, this is just defined as the poset of non-trivial isotropic subspaces inside Q to the power of 2n. And then the set of subspaces becomes a poset if I give it the inclusion order. Yes, so uh, the fact here implies that V will never be the whole space. Okay, so this is maybe the poster definition. I don't know if we have seen the poster definition of a Pitts building yet. 
So uh, let me just say that there's a simplicial complex associated to it. So as a simplicial complex, uh, the K simplices uh, will be flags of isotropic subspaces. Ah, yeah, here you mean. Right, so they are proper, uh, there's proper containment going on. Thank you. Okay, so now we can use this fact to calculate the dimension uh, of the symplectic piece building. Uh, a maximal isotropic subspace uh, has dimension n. So if I write that here, the maximal flag uh, or the maximal simplex that I can uh, produce will have dimension n minus one. So the dimension of the Tietz building is n minus one. And uh, then um, there will be a natural action on the Tietz building by the symplectic group. And this just amounts to the fact that if I act by some element in the general linear group, then it preserves this order relation here. And uh, the fact that if I act by symplectic matrices, uh, then this notion of isotropy of, of an isotropic subspace is preserved. So this, this gives us action here. And now, uh, well, every Tietz building comes with a um, Solomon Tietz theorem. So they they have a general theory of buildings for uh, in which in which they prove their theorem. So, and this is a special instance of the theorem. So Solomon Tietz. Uh, prove that the symplectic Tietz building is in fact a wedge of spheres of dimension n minus one. So the geometric dimension of this Tietz building. And then as part of the theorem of Borel Sayer that I mentioned before, uh, they identify uh, the dualizing module exactly with the top dimensional uh, homology of the seats building where the action comes exactly from the action that I defined here, but now restricted uh, to the, the integer symplectic group. So the Steinberg module is exactly the reduced n minus first homology of this seats building with integer scope. Okay. Are there any questions about the symplectic seat building and the Steinberg module? No, that's good. Um, okay. So now I have explained uh, the domain and the target of the map uh, that of this uh, symplectic modular symbol map. So now we're gonna uh, give a definition of, of the map itself. So let me define the map in Gunnell's theorem. So what we want to construct is a map from the group ring of the special linear groups, uh, sorry, of the symplectic groups into the Steinberg module. And the Steinberg module we just identified with the top dimensional reduced homology of the Tietz building. So this means what we need to do is we need to take some we need to take some symplectic matrix 
and then construct a homology class inside uh, the Steinberg module. So this homology class will be called the apartment class associated uh, apartment class associated with M. And the way that we gonna do this is, well, we know that this year uh, is a uh, is highly connected. So this means that this group here really can be identified uh, with the n minus first homotopy group uh, of the Higgs building uh, by Horowitz theory. So this means specifying this class is exactly the same as specifying a map uh, from Sn minus one into the Higgs building. And this is exactly the datum that we will get from this matrix. Uh, and we will even get for every M, we'll construct an embedding uh, from a sphere into uh, the Higgs building. So this is what I wanna do now. Uh, so I'm gonna explain a procedure of doing this and I will just start with n equal to one, then go to n equal to two. And after that, uh, you will already know how the pattern continues. So let n be equal to one. Yes. Uh, in this case, our symplectic matrix just has two column vectors, uh, which corresponds exactly to one symplectic pair. Okay. So now we can't have a symplectic pair if we want to construct an isotropic subspace, but each of these will generate an isotropic subspace for us inside uh, Q. So this means we get two points, namely the vector space spanned by M1 and the vector space spanned by M1 bar. And this will sit inside the symplectic heat building in one. So in particular, we get a map from S0, which is just two dots, specified by exactly this matrix, uh, mapping onto these two. So in n equal to one, we are done. For n equal two, how does a matrix look like? Well, now, really the only thing that happens is that we get an additional symplectic pair. namely this pair M2 and M2 bar. So on the outer coordinates, we already know what to do. We get two one-dimensional isotropic subspaces associated to this. Well, and that's also the case for these inner, these inner two elements. So both of them gives a, give us a one-dimensional isotropic subspace. But now we can also take uh, larger subsets, namely I can take these two subsets and they will give me an isotropic uh, subspace of dimension two, which is contained uh, in which these two uh, vector spaces are contained. So this gives me a point here, which corresponds to the span of M1 and M2. And then inside the Tietz building, we'll have an inclusion map. We will get an edge to that point from these two vectors. And then similarly, we can continue around the circle. Each of these two will always span an isotropic subspace. So we'll end up with this subdivided suspension of this uh, S0 sphere. So this will be an S1 inside uh, the symplectic Keats building too. In particular, we can now define a map just using the datum of M, which goes from the suspension of S0 into this map, uh, into this uh, apartment. So these subcomplexes here are what, what are called uh, symplectic apartments. Well, and then the pattern continues. 
if n is equal to three, we get another symplectic pair. This will give a suspension of this picture here. So this means that we can specify a map from the twofold suspension of S0 into the Pitts building um, three. And then the pattern continues like that. Okay, so these define homotopy classes and then we take Kurovitz theorem to produce a class um, in the Steinberg module. Okay, maybe this is now uh, a good point to remark that what the difficulty of Gunnell's theorem really is, namely the construction that I just explained, of course also works if we, uh, if we take symplectic matrices over Q. So in a similar fashion, you can define a map In a similar fashion, you can find a map which goes from the group ring of the symplectic groups over Q into the Steinberg module. And the thing that I want to stress here is really the Q. Um, so in the uh, exercises, uh, we will discuss a how one can prove uh, the Solomon Heath theorem uh, for symplectic groups. Uh, we'll discuss a proof that is, uh, or that I learned from uh, Laden Bastina. Um, and it's Solomon, Solomon Heath theorem, in fact, already explained uh, or in due, sorry, uh, implies uh, that this map here is uh, surjective. So the difficulty of uh, Gunnell's theorem really lies in, uh, with this integrality condition. Um, and, state, and, and the theorem really states that we can find a much smaller generating set of the Steinberg module um, than given by the Solomon Heath theorem. Okay. Great. Okay, so now I would start uh, Proving Gunnell's theorem. Are there any questions about the setup before that? Yep. Yep. So the question was can one vary the symplectic form? Uh, well, yes, I, I just gave the definition of the standard symplectic form. So yeah, the answer is that there is uh, essentially one. Okay. Yep, Kai. So um, could you comment a bit about this Solomon Tits thing being homotopy equivalent to S n minus one? Because the one that we've seen is S n minus two, right? What's going on with this dimension? Ah, uh, yeah, right. So uh, there's a shift going on in the dimension of the Tits building. So uh, if you recall the Tits building that was defined for uh, special linear groups uh, was of dimension n minus two. And the reason was that we only allowed proper subspaces uh, of uh, Q to the n. Uh, but this restriction does not apply for, uh, for the symplectic framework because there we just look at isotropic subspaces. So we can go up half the dimension. Okay, are there more questions? No, great. So then let's uh, try to prove this theorem. Okay. So now we're gonna go and give an alternative uh, proof of Gunnell's theorem. 
And the strategy will be similar. So it, it will be in the spirit of uh, the proofs that uh, Church Park and Putman used to prove uh, the high dimensional vanishing um, of the cohomology of special linear groups. Um, so I want to start by giving a rough outline of the proof. And then we'll discuss the details uh, or fill, fill out as many details as possible um, afterwards. So the general strategy is as follows. Uh, we start with the group ring of the symplectic groups. And now what, what I just explained to you is that there is this modular symbol map, which assigns a symplectic matrix its apartment class. So there's a map into the symplectic Steinberg module. And now the idea will be to give a geometric sort of factorization uh, of this map into three different maps and then prove that all of these are uh, subjective. So then if we get a commutative diagram, this map here will be subjective as well. And what do I be mean by geometric? So uh, two uh, models will show up, two simplicial complexes uh, that will sort of, one of them will be what, a, yeah, what one can call a, a integral model for the symplectic Steinberg module. So there are uh, simplicial complexes Uh, which I, for now, just want to call X and Y. And morphisms uh, with the following property. So there is a map, which I will call S, from the N minus first homology of the complex X integrally uh, onto uh, the Steinberg module. So this means in particular that this homology here will parameterize the generators of the Steinberg module as well. So this, is, this will be uh, the integral model and it will be built from line decompositions of Z to the power of two N. Um, yes, but we will, we will see more about this in a minute. Then uh, the complex X will be contained in a larger complex. And this complex Y will have the property that it's N minus first homology vanishes. So this means that the two complexes will sit in, inside a long exact sequence where I have here the N's homo relative homology of Y relative to X. And then Y will have the property that the N minus first homology vanishes. So this means that if I look at the connecting morphism, uh, this map here will be exactly then surjective if this group here vanishes. Okay, so this is somehow the geometric, the geometric content of the theory. It's this vanishing result proving a connectivity statement about Y. So now uh, this group here is parameterizing the generators of Steinberg. And now uh, we need to construct a map from this, from this group ring here into this relative homology group and show that the generators inside this relative homology group are in fact parameterized by the symplectic group. Okay, so this is, this is the two, uh, this is the three step process. And then one needs to verify that this diagram here commutes. And then the surjectivity of this map here follows. Okay. 
are there any questions about the general strategy so far? No, great. So then, of course, the mystery is what are these complexes X and Y? So what I want to do is I want to explain, um, uh, I first want to give a model for X uh, that will not work. And then uh, I'm gonna explain the sequence of problems that one encounters uh, in order to modify X and construct Y from X. Okay, so we'll attach additional cells to X in order to construct Y. Okay. So if you have been uh, to the lectures of Jennifer Wilson, uh, there, uh, I think she used a um, a complex of um, of, of frames uh, of, well, of yeah of frames um, of Zn uh, in order to uh, prove the vanishing result of the top homology inside um, well, of of the special linear groups, and so one could just try to write down an analogous complex uh, to start with. So this is what I what I want to do. So I'm gonna define what uh, the complex of isotropic partial frames is. So the k-simplices inside this complex. So k-simplex uh, will exactly correspond to a set of lines well uh, it's a zero simplex so <laughs> it's a set of lines uh, inside uh, z to the power of uh, 2n so this is this will be the integral model or a candidate for the integral model these are lines inside z to the power of 2n. And then they need to satisfy uh, an, isotrop an isotropic condition. Namely, if I look at the set of factors chosen up to a sign, then this will be a partial isotropic symplectic basis. So what this means is that this is a subset of a symplectic basis of z to the power of 2n with the property that the set does not contain a symplectic pair. So this is the isotropic condition. Um, right, so now we have a line decomposition of z to the power of 2n. And if I take a simplex delta inside this complex, um, then because of this isotropy condition, I can look at the q span and get a well defined isotropic subspace, so an element inside the symplectic group solo. So this way, uh, we produce the map from IN to the symplectic group building. And now we can look at the fibers of this, uh, of this map. And the fibers will turn out to be exactly the complexes that showed up in Jennifer Wilson's lectures. And there, I think we have either seen or seen a statement at least that uh, these fibers are highly connected. So this result, which is due to Church Farb and Tubman and maybe Matson. 
implies that uh, this map here uh, will induce a surjection on the n minus first homology. onto the standard module, which is the top dimensional homology of this. Okay, so this means that we are in good shape. I'll call this map F. Namely, we have successfully found some complex X, which is an integral model for uh, the symplectic Steinberg module in the sense that we built it only out of data that is contained in Z to the two N. And uh, we have a subjection onto the standard module. Okay, so uh, let me just point out one thing. Uh, this complex here also has dimension n minus one, exactly for the same reason uh, as the TIT building does. Namely, if I want to have like a maximal subset uh, that is, does not contain uh, symplectic pairs, will have cardinality n. Uh, so this means the geometric dimension of this complex uh, is also n minus one. So this is really the top dimensional homology that is turning that. Um, right. So now this analogy with the uh, symplectic teeth building actually already tells us what some of the generators are inside uh, the homology of this complex here. Namely, we get mirror images uh, of the symplectic apartments that we have discussed before. So inside this complex I, uh, we'll find that for each symplectic basis, which I'll call, so now I'll let n equal b2, we'll find a square like this. All of these span a line inside z. And then two of these neighboring pairs will exactly correspond to an isotopic uh, subgroup. So this means that there are edges and this is exactly what will be mapped to an apartment class inside uh, the tip building. So now we want to construct a complex out of this complex IN, uh, which has this property that the N minus first homology vanishes. So this means in particular, what we want to do is we want to kill these classes. So this means that we need to glue in cells that make this zero. And for this, we will need to glue in a one cell, which we, called, which we will call sigma cells, because they correspond to a symplectic pair. And then we will also allow isotropic uh, information on the side. So this leads to a candidate uh, for the complex Y. Namely, we can now make the definition of i n sigma. Um, and here the k simplices uh, will correspond to, again, lines inside uh, z to the power of 2n. But now we allow one symplectic pair. So this means in particular, the complex IN will be a subcomplex of this. Well, now comes the first problem. Uh, we did not kill, yep. uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, I'm keeping this. Um, so now we come to the first problem. Uh, and that is, this complex here is not highly connected enough, namely the candidate for, for Y. Um, this is in general not N minus one connected. So we did not kill all the, the homology in degree N minus one by gluing in the apartments. So this is the case if n is even. And the cycles that 
that survive are of the following shape, I can take the first basis vector of some symplectic matrix, the second um, basis vector, and then add them together. So this is like a linear dependency. And then for n equal to two, this will give me a cycle inside uh, this complex here, which one can prove that it's non-trivial. So now the next step is, the next idea is to get rid of these cycles. So now we add more cells that kill these. These are called delta cells. And now it's a theorem of Putman, uh, which is a difficult uh, connectivity co calculation that the resulting complex is in fact N minus one connected. The resulting complex, I will now have two decorations, one for the sigma cells, one for the de delta cells, and this will be an N minus one connected complex. Okay, this is great. So now we have a candidate for, uh, for X, which is still our, our complex uh, IN. Uh, this sits inside here. And we can take this here as the candidate for our complex Y. Then we get a sequence of maps. And we know that this here is a, a subjection because uh, of the theorem of Putman. And uh, we know this surjectivity statement because we have this theorem of Matson or uh, church of Putman. Now the problem is, the next problem is that this map here will not be surjective in general. This is now let me just tell you uh, shortly how this map alpha n is defined. We'll just recycle uh, this diagram here. So I'll define it for n equal to q. <clears throat> so whenever we have a symplectic matrix, then we can find the outer subcomplex inside i n. Uh, and then if we fix the first symplectic pair that occurs in our symplectic matrix, so M equal to E1, E2, E2 bar, E1 bar. So now we fix this outer pair, then I can map this, this matrix uh, onto this disk. And this will give me some generator inside this relative homology group. Now the problem is that this map is not surjective. So now one needs to attach more cells. And this is the content of the next proposition, which Benjamin, uh, Peter, and I proved. We can attach more cells. So there exists a complex IN. And this complex has the following two properties. The first one is that the inclusion of this complex that church uh, that Putman studied into this complex I n is n connected. So this in particular implies that this complex here will also be n minus one connected. So we can use uh, Putman's connectivity results, and it has the property that the map that is still defined like this from the group ring into the relative homology, but now we change the integral model of I n relative to I delta n. So this I delta n is uh, the complex obtained by only gluing in the, um, the delta cells, not the sigma cells. Uh, this is a subjection. 
And now this completes the proof because we can now uh, put the complex I n, I a n, and I delta n here. Then Putman connectivity result and property one will tell us that this year uh, will subject onto the n minus first homology of, uh, of I delta. And now, and now um, the surge activity of this needs to be done a little bit different because we have changed the complex. The fibers will be different, but it turns out that the fibers are now the complexes that show up in the proof of the co-dimension one conjecture um, for special linear groups. So this is a result of uh, Church Putman that proved that the fibers of this map are highly connected. So then we get surjectivity of, of this map as well. So this is Church Putman. And then we have all these surjections and one needs to check uh, that the diagram commutes. And uh, this implies that uh, the symplectic modular symbol map is in fact a surjection. Thank you. Um, are there questions? Maybe in, I ask Zoom again first, and if somebody's here, they can lift their hand and I can go uh, towards them. If there is not, yeah, there is one up there. Uh, maybe I'll ask a question while I walk there. <laughs> um, can you quickly explain uh, why the picture you drew is a homology class in the relative homology? So it has boundary and. Oh, yeah, I mean, okay. So um, what I've gone in white uh, is contained exactly uh, in IN. Right, so this is this is how I first defined this diagram. Uh, so it's in particular also contained in I delta. And now the delta cells are only added uh, when we move to this complex here. So this means the whole disk uh, will be inside I n, and then uh, well we mod out by that. So in the quotient, this will just give us a sphere. All right. Here's another question. Is there an easy example of a class that is not it? I mean, you state this problem that this map is not subjective. Yep. Okay. Uh, yes. So uh, let's assume. Uh, so uh, this was about something that was written here before. So, but it's a it's a good question. So let's look at SP two and Z. And now we map it into the relative homology uh, of I sigma delta n, I n. So now let's assume that this here is surjective. Okay. Then uh, because of high connectivity, we can just compose, right? So in particular, this map here will be subjective. And now we will map into the n minus first homology of I n. Uh, now this complex here sits inside the complex uh, I sigma. Okay. So there's a map going into n minus one of I sigma, and this map here also. Uh, Sorry, this here is a composition. Uh, this map here uh, is also defined if we just go, if we just allow the sigma cells, right? Because, uh, we don't need uh, delta cells to, to define what, what this disk is, right? Uh, so in particular, this map here will be the zero map because we have glued in the delta cells, right? Uh, so this composition here will be a composition of uh, surjections uh, that is zero, but we know that this 
homology group here is uh, non-zero exactly because of uh, the classes that come from the delta set. So these are exactly the examples. Yep. Yes, yeah, sir. Be right there. So this was about code I mentioned one. Yep. Do you have, suppose you. Oh, this was about code I mentioned zero. Yep. Zero. Ah. Yeah. Sorry, yes. Can, but you also study code I mentioned one. Yep. Does this method somehow get too complicated after this or? It gets very complicated. Uh, is there any hope of doing code I mentioned two by a similar method or would you have to invent something different? Well, yeah. So in general, as you have seen, maybe for the code I mentioned zero case in the special linear groups, you only needed to attach one, one type of cells, which were the apartments. Uh, so here we already needed for the code I mentioned zero case, we needed to attach a bunch of cells. Uh, so we are currently working on um, on the code I mentioned one case uh, for which we will attach lots more cells. <laughs> um, and of course this data uh, does not become, uh, or it becomes com complicated to control it. So I guess it, it would be preferable to have a, a method, a different like systematic approach to um, the slightly big complex in, in a different way. Yeah. But, but the problem is the same as with SL and Z, where you have also these kind of methods, but they just become more and more complicated. And maybe we don't know if there's more obstructions there. Any more questions? Maybe on Zoom, see if anything in the chat. If that is not the case, let's thank uh, Robin again. Thank you.